array of satellite uh, uh, systems. When I started as a student, we didn't have any of those really. We had SST uh, to some degree. And in fact, I was a uh, graduate student. Gene Feldman was essentially a graduate student of Dick Barber's working in Stony Brook, working through the first color, sc uh, color scanner uh, data sets. So what are, what, let's, let's now start to dig in a little further into uh, what are some of the ecosystem responses of these climate uh, uh, events. And again, we'll, we'll keep on with the El Nino story. Uh, this was published in the, uh, in, in the uh, journal National Geographic uh, uh, soon after the 82, 83 El Nino just showing the uh, uh, conceptual model that we developed during the uh, 82 L3, three El Nino with the normal uh, conditions, the thermocline being shallow and, and this compost water that I talked to you about earlier, which is rich in nutrients, getting brought up to the surface by the action of the winds and the rotation of the earth. Uh, a when it comes in contact with sunlight, it gets fertilized and there is a, a growth of phytoplankton and we have happy fishermen off Peru. When, when the thermocline deepens, this upwelling process can continue, but the, the water that gets recruited is from above the thermocline and therefore does not have the same enrichment process as it does otherwise. And, and what happens uh, uh, in the biota is quite spectacular. Uh, uh, the normal uh, uh, biota uh, uh, suffers, they become uh, malnourished, and uh, move to cooler waters. And, and that space that's normally cold is invaded by tropical species. That same uh, thing happened recently off California. And I put this slide in for Kendra. She asked me if I was gonna talk about the blob and I said I wasn't, but I thought I would put in a slide. Th this is the record uh, 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 since we got to Monterey we started a mooring program in collaboration with PMEL, which has now evolved, and this is the record of that mooring site from its inception to, uh, uh, again, uh, a few days ago. Uh, and I've highlighted the uh, 97, 98 El Nino. What we've done here is we've taken the average out, and, and, and climatologists work in anomalies. How different is it from the mean? And so this means that on average, here, the temperature was three degrees warmer than, it, than the average. And during this period here, from 97 to the present, it was actually, on average, cooler. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And then we had this abnormal blob, uh, uh, which was a warming of the uh, uh, eastern Pacific, northeastern Pacific, but without an El Nino. There was no warming along the equator, and the thermocline was not particularly deep. But in terms of the magnitude of anomalies, it was quite similar to what, we, what was seen in 97, 98. That blob sort of broke in the spring of 2015, and then we got the 2015-16 El Nino off of California. And, and in terms of uh, the impacts biologically, this was perhaps even stronger than some of the uh, uh, less or even strong events. Uh, the normal uh, biota, uh, the, the uh, sea lions or seals, or the, the local seabirds were uh, 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 impoverished and lost many of their year classes. We got invaded by uh, species that are no, not normally found in the area. Uh, tuna came in, in in great quantities following one of their favorite preys, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, the pelagic red crab. But there was an incredible change in the, in the communities. Uh, we had a huge uh, uh, bloom of a toxic diatom, Pseudonychia, that ranged uh, uh, all the way from Santa Barbara all the way up to the, uh, I think it, it, even into Canada. Uh, and uh, uh, talk a little bit more about, the, uh, about what happened with, the, uh, with these crabs. And it, all the way up and down the coast, in particular, I think during times when these waves were propagating past us, they were brought on shore and they created these huge uh, uh, meadows. Uh, and this is what one of these looks like. Uh, 
And this is what the stomach of the bluefin tuna that were caught look like. And it actually, uh, uh, this shows you that the, 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 var the bluefin tuna uh, uh, diet changed pretty dramatically during this period. But they're, they're well known predators of these tuna crabs, which are normally found off of Baja California and were infected northward up into Monterey during, these, uh, during this event. Uh, in, in other parts of the ocean, w now with the ability to tag, them, tag animals, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, we can see what the impacts uh, are on tuna in the western Pacific. During La Nina, as the cold water grows in, 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 into the uh, central and eastern Pacific, the uh, uh, tuna migrate out of that area because uh, uh, physiologically they uh, are not favored. They, 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 they want warmer water, but to be at the, in the edge of that. And, and the opposite happens during El Nino. As this war, warmer or cooler water that's normally part of the equatorial cool sun disappears, it opens up a, an area for them to invade, and they uh, uh, migrate uh, uh, westward into, the, into that area. So we've talked a bit uh, about El Nino, and I want to uh, jump now onto some of these longer term uh, 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 fluctuations, in particular the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or El Viejo and La Vieja. And what I didn't mention earlier about, what, about the uh, primary productivity is that the, the variability in primary productivity, and this triangle is very similar to the one, uh, uh, the El Nino one, the, the variability in global productivity is driven by this triangle. Uh, as it goes up and down, so does global primary productivity. And I kid my colleagues and I say, well, if I'm in this area and I'm making measurements in Monterey, then I can measure uh, uh, productivity in Monterey and I can tell you what the global productivity is going to be or how it's changing. And indeed, if you, if you look at, at things, and I'll show you, there is some truth to that. Uh, but th anyway, this triangle of, uh, is, is what dri drives, mo the, the pattern of this triangle drives most of the variability. Today, uh, that triangle, I, I, and I won't get into this, and maybe the speaker, one of our speakers tomorrow will be, is associated with, a, with lower oxygen. Uh, when it, 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 apparently, from what we know, when the world is colder, this, tri the var this variability disappears and appears only when, we're, when we have a warmer world as a result of uh, uh, the uh, uh, variations in the, uh, in the winds, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. And, and there are some well-known uh, uh, shifts, regime shifts, associated with these years in 1925. The sardine disappeared in, in the 1940s, uh, thought to be uh, primarily due to overfishing, and certainly overfishing probably had something to do with it, but climate did as well. There's a, a very uh, sharp change in 1976, the well-known regime shift, and then we went into a recent cooling, and, and a question that, we're, uh, uh, that is on everybody's mind is, is this 2015-16 event going to switch us into, the, into a different state? Is the world going to change again? Uh, I, my bet is that not yet, but soon. And if we look at, uh, at the trends in different properties over the recent record, this happens to be the trend in SST, the areas that are uh, uh, blue are areas where it's actually cooling. On average, the world is warming, but it's not warming or cooling uniformly. The same is true with sea level. Sea level in Indonesia has, is increasing at a much faster rate than it is in the Eastern Pacific, or had been. And, and the, these uh, 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 changes have, had been, have been linked, the, those variations have been linked to the uh, variations in these uh, sardine and anchovy regimes. Uh, during this recent event, uh, the uh, California sardine didn't get the memo that uh, uh, climate had changed, and, it's, and it behaved a little differently than the sardines in, in, in Peru and Japan, who seemed to follow the same pattern. 
but the, but the California sardine stayed al around in, in a time when it was cooler. Okay, this is probably the, the trickiest uh, uh, figure that I have. Uh, and, and this uh, uh, paper, which is a very nice paper by England et al, talking about the uh, uh, global warming hiatus and uh, associating it with changes in the winds. So this uh, um, top panel is the same figure or a, a different representation of the figure that I showed at the beginning with the, this happens to be global air temperature anomalies, but global air temperature anomalies, and, and let's look at them here, sea surface temperature and sea air temperature, at least over the ocean, are pretty much identical to each other. So again, this, this period of, of rapid warming, this period of basically flat temperatures, another rapid warming, and then this uh, warming hiatus, which has been the subject of considerable debate. We're not, I don't wanna get into that debate right now. Uh, all of these uh, are trends of different properties. So we, I showed you earlier the trends in SST uh, over time, over the recent record, and with this cooling in this triangle, and then it's cooling in air temperature. And the same is true with sea level. Those are basically the same uh, uh, patterns that we'd seen before. And in the top panel is our barometric pressure. And these areas are high pressure areas. In each of the uh, uh, basins, there tends to be a, high, a very high pressure area. And then the biggest low in the globe is the Indonesian low. And, and what this uh, uh, map shows you is that these high pressure systems had been getting stronger over the last 15 or so years. And that, that has increased since the winds rotate around in this direction that had le led to stronger winds as seen in these vectors. The trends in winds have been stronger over the last 15 years, uh, actually creating a, a, a much lower uh, uh, pressure in the Indian Ocean. And this is the time series of the winds. And uh, what I meant here is that it, w when the values are negative, it means that the trade winds are stronger. And what we tend to see here is that this feature is unusual in this record. And again, raising the question, is this something that has changed? And has it, been, has it changed because of something we have done? Or has it changed just because it's part of the natural climate system? And, and unfortunately, we don't really have the data, I don't think, to answer that question very uh, definitively. And here it is, I was showing you, uh, telling you that, uh, that if you look at this decadal analysis and you compare it to Monterey Bay, and this is a time series of temperature and salinity, of combined temperature and salinity from Monterey Bay and the first mode, and you plot them together, they, they tend to be following the same drummer. There's some offsets here, but uh, the, that's what the nature of the Eastern Pacific, the Eastern Pacific in general, feels these events in a much cleaner way than the Atlantic does, I think. And so uh, the, the uh, uh, West Coast community uh, comes together to discuss these things uh, quite a bit as they did for the, uh, the blob uh, problem. And this is the, the uh, uh, extent of the time series. It's actually not up to date, but when I went to Ambari, we started a time series. And this is temperature. Uh, chlorophyll, oxygen, the sightings of, of, of this giant squid, Decidicus, a time series of CO2 and pH, and uh, CO2 measured from a mooring. These two records are probably the longest of their kind for any coastal environment and maybe for any place ever. And in general, you see this switch that happened after 97, 98, when in general the ocean became colder more productive, and there was a switch towards lower oxygen. And uh, our, our, your speaker tomorrow may uh, probably argue that that decline uh, was driven by an increase in productivity in that local area. There's also the possibility that it could be related to a decrease in ventilation. And if you take 
the, uh, these uh, trends and you, put, and you expand on them and we plotted them here against the, the uh, uh, atmosphere. The green is the uh, ocean record at Monterey Bay. Uh, red is the atmosphere. pH at uh, uh, hot site, pH in Monterey. And uh, uh, we are naturally more acidic because of the upwelling process. The upwelling process tends to bring the uh, 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 higher CO2 water from below to the surface making us much more acidic, if you want to call it that, uh, than hot. And, and this difference in the uh, slopes may be explained by the fact that we, we had this shift and went into a, uh, um, a colder regime because as oxygen decreases, CO2 and nitrate increase in the upwell waters. And I don't know if this is fortuitous, but right at the time where the, where, these, where the ocean goes from a so sink off Monterey to a source is when we had that shift. Okay, so we're about ready to shift gears here uh, um, and go into, uh, okay, so we know that the uh, uh, biota changed, but we don't have a really good picture of how it changes. And how can we, how can we change that picture? And I argue that uh, there, there is an emergence of new sensors, in particular for biogeochemistry. Uh, uh, there is a bioargo effort that I think has got a lot of momentum that in not that long too distant future, in addition to having sensors on these floats that measure temperature and salinity, we'll have many, many floats that will be measuring nitrate, oxygen, and pH. And hopefully in the uh, maybe a uh, little longer uh, 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 horizon, we will have uh, uh, sensors on systems like that that can tell us something about life in the sea. And, uh, this is from uh, uh, the review that I wrote in the 2003, where we went through the literature and said, oh yeah, we, you know, there's reports that when the climate changes, these things happen all over the world, but, but it was just... Uh, uh, um, mainly conjectures, I would say. We don't really have the data sets to look at the processes and why they happened and did it really happen. So what, what can we do to do that, change that? And, and, I, and I'm, what I want to do is go over a few of the uh, uh, emerging technologies that are on the horizon uh, that may allow us to uh, get a, a much better picture in the future of this so that we can tell uh, and predict and uh, manage uh, the health of our oceans. So there, uh, there are four, uh, and this, uh, I, I have listed four, and there may be other ones. Uh, optics is one of them, uh, both particle optics and, and video imaging. Acoustics, with active uh, 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 acoustics and then passive listening. Genomics and animals as animal tagging. And I'm gonna spend uh, 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 most of my time, or I'm not gonna talk very much at all about these first two, because they are more mature, and uh, spend some time on these last two, and also talk a little bit about new uh, smart platforms uh, that may allow us uh, uh, to move in the correct direction. So let me spend a little time, this is, uh, uh, when I get bored, I uh, work with a, a, a talented graphics artist and try to put things on pictures as to uh, saying what, what are the things we can do. Our, our kind of our older technology, I'll call it, are these moorings that are fixed to the bottom and have uh, uh, sensors on them measuring a, wide, a variety of properties and sending them back to see to us on, in near real time. A new generation of uh, uh, surface vehicles, uh, and there's several of them. This happens to be something we call the wave glider, which uh, uh, uses, there's a window chain down here, which they actually call the glider part, that as the wave motion uh, acts on it, it, pro it propels the, the uh, vehicle forward. And, and the vehicle has control of a rudder, and it can actually go in directions. And if you, if you plotted the... Uh, 
a track of one of these vehicles, you would see that it moves in a very, especially under high seas, in a very straightforward fashion. On, that, on those vehicles, we can put a variety of sensors. There are a couple of solar panels that support the instrumentation. Uh, we can tow bodies that perhaps have acoustic devices on them that can image for uh, uh, krill uh, or uh, fish schools. Uh, here are some examples of tags that you can put on animals and follow them around the world. Uh, now developing uh, cameras to go on those tags so we, we can understand when a, an animal goes to a certain location, what is it doing? These white sharks, for example, uh, come to feed off the coast of Monterey, very near to our area, for, and they're about ready to leave now. And they go south of Hawaii to something they call the people call the uh, Great White Shark Cafe. And, and the males uh, 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 have this uh, um, behavior where they bounce up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, four to, in, from zero to 500 meters. And then they stop. And they don't know why they're doing that. One hypothesis is that, is that they're hunting for, uh, uh, they're smelling, trying to smell pheromones. And so they're going up and down trying to locate a, a mate uh, to reproduce. And so we're trying to put t uh, cameras that will uh, go with the sharks all the way out there, intelligently know when they've stopped bouncing, and film whatever they went there to, to go do. Uh, we don't know if we'll be successful, but those are the types of things that are, are evolving. We're starting to uh, uh, put ecogenomic sensors on these uh, 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 underwater vehicles, and I'll talk more about those. The, the animals themselves can carry sensors and tell us something about uh, um, the environment or tell us about the environment that they're living in. Uh, these are our standard gliders. This happens to be a spray glider. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, undergoing development of uh, these coastal floats that have the ability to uh, uh, sink into the mud and then have enough uh, buoyancy to remove themselves from the mud and not be exported from the coastal area so we can uh, have, uh, and we're putting uh, uh, sediment trap collectors on those types. Uh, of course, um, um, Ambari's been big on eight, eight, uh, ROVs, trying to take that same technology that we've, they've been using to observe animals with video and put them on AUVs, uh, and then also doing some of that work in the near shore. I think those are the examples that I wanted to highlight here. So I'll start with the animal tagging. And really this, this uh, technology, and this is work that's uh, been, been done uh, primarily by Barb Block and the top team, uh, and, 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 and I credit her slides. Uh, these, these different, uh, so the color down here tells you the uh, animal. Here are the sharks. Here is the great white, the, the uh, shark cafe. They, they come and feed in here, and then they go out here for several months, believe, to reproduce, and then 